today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you how to make electronic printed circuits on 3D printed parts. Some of you may remember I did a video that sounded just like this years ago, and in that video I was showing how to make copper traces on SLA printed parts. And to be honest, it didn't really work very well. At the end of the video, the biggest problem I had is that the copper traces didn't have good adhesion. They would basically just peel right off the surface. And the reason for that is that the catalyst I was using that created the copper was just applied to the surface. There really wasn't any good adhesion there and the, the traces would just peel off. It was not usable. But three things have changed in the last few years to make this an actually very useful technique. Uh, one of them is desktop SLS printing. So the folks at Micronics gave me this printer to try out. And instead of just doing typical product reviews, you know I really like to push the limits and come up with something weird. And I knew that putting catalyst into the powder and sintering it into the nylon would be a great way to solve this adhesion problem that I had. Another thing that changed is that pulsed lasers are a whole lot more common today. So five years ago, very few people had pulsed lasers, you know, Galvo scanner laser systems. And these days you can get them for a few thousand dollars and they're also desktop. And then finally, this is kind of silly, I used ChatGPT to fine tune my copper plating bath. I had a lot of problems making a stable electroless copper plating bath. And with the help of ChatGPT, I was able to get that under control as you'll see. These SLS printers work by distributing a very fine layer of nylon powder and then using a laser to center it as the laser draws across the part. So if we want to incorporate a powder, some other powder into our print, we can just mix it with the nylon and let it get sintered along with everything else. The trick is that we can't change the so-called albedo of the material because it has to absorb the laser light to become sintered. So for example, all these parts are gray and that is not an accident. If we wanted to print in white nylon, it's much, much more difficult because it doesn't absorb as much laser light and it's more difficult to sinter. Luckily, the catalyst that we're using is quite black. It's copper chromite, which is a copper chromium crystal. It's an oxide, and it is not conductive, and it also is not a catalyst until it gets hit by a pulsed laser. You can shine the continuous wave laser on it all day long and nothing happens. It still won't plate any copper. It has to be hit by a pulsed laser, which has pulse powers of tens or hundreds of kilowatts, and so it's kind of a fundamentally different process than the laser that's in an SLS printer. After the part is printed, we go through the standard cleanup process, which involves uh, taking the part and putting it into a sifter bin that Micronics provides. And this is currently 3D printed in the prototype, but will be injection molded in production. And this works well to remove about 60% uh, of the powder. Most of it just falls into the bottom of the bucket and can be reused a few times. Um, the, mo the rest of the powder is sticking so tightly to the part it either needs to be cleaned up with a really stiff bristle brush or the best option is a media blaster which I'm using. Uh, it really does work much better and faster. And uh, luckily since the catalyst is not activated by any sort of harsh abrasion you can really be very um, aggressive with the media blaster and not worry about activating the surface in any way. So after bead blasting we take our part and this is important, clean it in a in basically dish soap. I used a uh, fancy surfactant called Triton X, but really dish soap would be fine too. And the point of this is to remove all of that catalyst dust that is now sticking to the surface. And we'll see why this is a problem later, but removing dust, even though it doesn't appear to be there, is, is important. Once the part is cleaned and dried, it's ready for laser exposure. And this is my laser setup. It's not a typical um, 1064 nanometer scanning laser that you might get on AliExpress, for example. This was more or less donated to me, and it is a green laser. Uh, more, much rarer, but actually more difficult to use in this context because all of the parts out there are built for 1064 nanometer lasers. And this is a frequency doubled 532 green laser. Um, it's also only one watt, but it's still pulsed, and that's really what matters for this catalyst activation. Another lucky thing is that the catalyst absorbs light across the spectrum, so it doesn't really matter if you pulse it at 532 or 1064 nanometers. As long as you get the energy into the particle in that pulse, it will become activated. And so I uh, contacted CloudRay and basically asked them for the whole system except the laser itself and asked them to coat the optics at 532 nanometer. <laughs> what do you know? They actually sent the entire thing right away without any complaints whatsoever. So I got a green Gal a Galvo scanning system with the F-theta lens, the scanning head, 
and the controller, and uh, they even included, well, I paid for it, but they included um, light burn. So this whole part came together pretty quickly and was a fairly difficult thing to build. I also had an interesting problem mating the laser up to the Galvo scanner because the beam that comes out of this laser head is already pretty well collimated. It's about a millimeter in diameter, the laser beam. And I thought, great, I'll just shine it into the Galvo and it'll get focused down and, and make the part work. But I found out that <laughs> it didn't work at all. Um, and this was frustrating because I had already tested the laser with a lens, just holding the lens in front of the laser and just moving the um, plastic printed part in front of it just to see if the system was going to work at all. And that worked fine. So for some reason it worked with my optics, but not the professional optics that were even coded for 532 nanometer. And so after a bunch of wrangling, I figured out that the problem is that the, you actually want a very wide beam going into the F theta lens. If you go in with a very narrow beam, the final spot size is actually pretty terrible. And by terrible, I mean hundreds of microns, let's say. Uh, the, the theoretical minimum spot size is actually inversely proportional to the, the diameter of the beam that goes into the focusing lens. I, I admit I didn't know this, but this is a, a very common optics principle. And so when you buy these Galvo scanning heads, a lot of times they'll rate them in, in input aperture and the bigger apertures are more valuable. And I didn't quite understand what the point of that was, but this is like an eight or 10 millimeter input aperture. And that means that the widest beam you can get in there is eight or 10 millimeters in diameter. You want it to be large so that your final focus can be really good. So if you use the whole eight or 10 millimeters at 532 nanometer wavelength, your final focus is maybe about 50 microns, which is great, that, that works fine. So I had to come up with some optics quickly to get my beam expanded. So there's a little um, quartz ball lens in here. I used that just because I had it around, which very rapidly expands the beam. And then there's another lens in here that takes the expanding beam and converts it back to collimated before it goes into the Galvo head, then the F theta lens to get focused all the way down to the plane. The usable depth of field is surprisingly shallow. In fact, it's very hard to see, even you know, with laser goggles, dark and everything, to see when it's really in focus. And so the easiest way to focus it is to move the, the little jack stand up and down very carefully and listen for it. And when you hit focus, it'll actually sizzle. You can hear the catalyst and or nylon being vaporized by the beam, and it makes a very distinct sizzling noise. Uh, but again, if you're more than a couple millimeters too high or too low, the sizzling goes away, and so does the effectiveness of activating the catalyst. So in this video, you'll see I'm only making planar parts, but really the excitement over this whole method is that you can get curved you know, traces. That's the whole exciting bit, is that you would 3D print something and then get a curved trace on it. And I'm gonna talk about that after, at the end of the video, after we talk about plating these coppers. But trust me, I, I am thinking about that quite a bit. While the parts are getting lasered, we can start mixing up our copper plating batch here. And this, this took quite a bit of iteration. So every one of these pages was a different um, recipe that I tried for copper plating. And you might think, well, it's, it's such a standard process. I mean, every single circuit board house in the world uses electroless copper plating to plate through holes on every single printed circuit board that's been made. But all of the formulas are proprietary and secret. And even if you look into patents, there isn't a whole lot of specific numbers that you can follow. They're all ranges so that the patent can cover everything. But that's a problem because the formula is actually very sensitive. You really can't double one of these values and expect anything to work. And the problem is if there's you know, four or five ingredients in a typical recipe and three of them are off, there's no way you can try tweaking variables one at a time to get it working. You're really just sort of shooting random darts. And it's true, the academic literature helps a little bit more because sometimes they post an exact recipe. But again, I, I'm pretty good at reading academic literature and coming up with working solutions. And I found this a fairly difficult task because of the number of variables and the poor um, specific stuff. And so I alluded at the beginning about ChatGPT helping me. And this is an interesting thing that I you know, encountered. In all of the literature I've ever read about electroless copper plating, patents, published papers, white papers, everything, they all talk about mixing your bath up by putting all these powders together. So every one of these ingredients is a powder to start with. You know, you got your copper sulfate, you got your EDTA, you got your NaOH. And if you do that, you will find that the bath basically fails immediately every time. When you get to the step of adding sodium hydroxide to this, 
the bath will just completely fall apart. Like all of the copper will precipitate out and it won't be usable at all. And when I, you know, sort of asked ChatGPT in, in an indirect way why this might happen, it said, oh, well, what you have to do is add your sodium hydroxide to water first. You can't just add the pellets directly to the bath. The reason being that, you know, this, this process is very pH sensitive. And if you just dump dry sodium hydroxide pellets in there at the surface of the pellet, the pH is extraordinarily high. I mean, the OH ion content is through the roof and that actually causes the copper to precipitate and the whole bath to crash. So what you have to do is first dissolve your sodium hydroxide in water and pour it in kind of slowly and then everything is okay. And that key piece of information was not available in any of the methods that I'm used to using, but was surfaced immediately by the language model, which I just thought was interesting. I'm not a fanboy. I don't any, own any stock or anything in OpenAI. I just think it's very interesting that this is a tool that I haven't had until recently in my career, and it solved kind of a lot of problems in a short amount of time. So anyway, I thought that was pretty cool, and it did solve the problem, and now we have a reliable copper plating bath. So we can tune this thing, again, asking ChatGPT, how do I make the bath more or less aggressive without compromising quality or the other stuff? And in about 30 minutes, take the part out of the bath and have this copper plate. And, uh, oh, I forgot one important step. After lasering, we clean it again in the Triton X100 or dish soap, just to make sure that any dust created in the lasering process is also off. Um, even though uh, unactivated catalyst is in theory not active, as it turns out in a bath like this, if there's lots of dust particles floating around, just the fact that they're so tiny creates a lot of surface energy and that will actually start the reaction. And this is a uh, self-catalytic process, an auto-catalytic process as they call it. So once anything gets coated with copper, it will continue the process, which is of course what we want. But if you have a tiny dust particle that catalyzes itself basically, it will become bigger and bigger and grow more and more copper. And then eventually that little dust particle now covered in copper will sit somewhere like on your part and grow more copper there. So another little, you know, <laughs> remedial function that I came up with is filtering the solution to make sure that there's no dust particles in there. So I came up with this tiny little peristaltic pump and a syringe filter. And that filters at maybe, you know, half a micron or something to make sure that all the dust in the solution is out. So stirring, filtering, temperature control, the right chemicals, it is in fact repeatable and I feel like I, I got the process under control. Right after the copper plating is done, we're basically ready for reflow. And so my preferred method of assembly is uh, solder paste dispensed from a syringe and then hot air. And I, to t test this out, I tried just a couple really simple circuits like a big battery and an LED just to test it out. And we'll rip one of those apart in a minute here just to test how good the adhesion is. And then I also found a, um, uh, an RF signal strength meter, basically an antenna, a diode, and an LED. And if you put it near a wireless router or your cell phone, it will pick up enough energy and light up the LED. Pretty cool. Uh, if you do this, you got to use a diode that's really fast. And a lot of times you'll see a, a 1N5711 diode specified. But a lot of manufacturers don't make very good 1N5711s. And so if you've tried this and it doesn't work, um, you got to go to Digikey or Mauser and buy a, a 1N5711 that's actually rated for up to, you know, 5 gigahertz of, of switching speed. Um, you can even just do it with a, a through-hole part. Just twist the leads together. You don't even need solder. Pretty cool. The trace and space width can get down to about a quarter millimeter, although a half is safer. And uh, the surface finish of the part comes into play here too. If you print a three, if you print a SLS part on an angle, uh, the layers give a little bit of surface texture. And so for really good planar surfaces, I printed the parts flat so that that top layer is just one continuous centered piece of nylon. And that gives you a really high quality surface and you, you really can get down to about quarter millimeter pitch uh, space and, and uh, trace in space. Okay, let's rip one of these apart on camera. This is the first time I've actually destroyed one of these. So you can see my, hear my real reaction to see how good the adhesion is on one of these. Yeah, so that's, that's about what I was expecting. Um, in fact, wait a minute. No, oh, no, it did actually pull the plastic out. I'll get some close-up shots of this. I mean, that's pretty good. I don't even think you would beat that with a fiberglass circuit board. In fact, yeah, that one, that one actually ripped the metal even of the battery holder. So I think that 
I think adhesion is pretty darn good as my official rating. Let's talk about putting traces on three-dimensional parts now. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned that this whole process is actually a commercial thing called metallized interconnect devices. And these are commercially used to do things like three-dimensional antennas in cell phones and uh, really mechanically constrained places. Also, again, like cell phones where you need to have wiring and mechanical support all jammed together in a super tight space. And you just can't afford to have like a circuit board in addition to like a plastic standoff. And so how do these guys do it? I just said the focal plane is really narrow. So you actually have to have dynamic focus if you want to make a part like this, where either the, you know, there's a, a moving optic or a moving um, support structure to get the focal plane at the right place if you have a curved surface like this. But here's an idea I came up with that I haven't heard anywhere else. Inside the printer, there's a laser diode facing horizontally like this. And then there's a big mirror right here that directs the beam down towards the surface and there's the two galvos up there. So my big idea was why don't we replace that mirror with a dichroic mirror and put the pulse laser on top firing straight down through the dichroic uh, allowing the sintering path to still go through the mirror so everything stays the same with the sintering laser path. I think it's about a 450 nanometer blue laser for sintering. In my case it's a 532 nanometer laser for um, activating the catalyst. And then as the machine is printing, it finishes sintering a laser, then activates the pulsed laser to activate the catalyst wherever you want on the entire layer. And then it just builds the next layer and does the same thing over. The benefit of this is that the focal plane is always flat, of course, because you just printed the layer, so you know it's flat. And it gives you the benefit of being able to activate the catalyst in areas of the print that you cannot optically see once the print is done. This is really cool. Nobody can do this. I, even in industry, I've never heard of this. But you could have hollow structures that have real copper traces on the inside of the structure quite realistically. I mean, this is, I, I think it's really going to work. Um, I didn't have time to engineer it, unfortunately, for this video. I should probably make more videos, is what a lot of you are saying. And I, you know, I, I agree with that too. But this is a pretty cool project that I, I'm interested in trying out. I think it has a really good chance of working and a good chance of making parts that you know, it solves this whole dynamic focus problem and allow, it gives you uh, additional capability all at the same time. So it'd be pretty exciting just to take a part out, bead blast it, throw it right in the copper plate and then reflow. And that's my, you know, dream scenario for making these very complicated three-dimensional parts. Maybe I should have also add, why do you even want three-dimensional printed parts with electronics on the outside? It's basically for things like you know, custom switches and, you know, wiring harnesses and things that need to be mechanically supported and have electronics and sensors at the right positions and everything. So I admit it's not the most uh, common thing in the world that you encounter when engineering and building things. But I think part of the reason for that is that it's just so difficult to do now. If you want to make one of these MIDs industrially now, it's a huge, huge setup tooling cost. But if you have a printer that can just make them in your shop, I guarantee people will find use for this in all kinds of different ways. You could start making your own connectors, no problem. Um, custom connectors that fit exactly the shape of thing that you need for a, a certain project. Or, you know, custom rotary switches. You can make your own, you know, metalized fingers that slide on a different surface to make a switch of any different size you want, basically. Um, anyway, I, I do like the idea of building tools and then seeing what everyone makes with it, which is actually part of the whole purpose of this printer. And you can see the circle kind of closing right there. So anyway, I, uh, I will be at open sauce. And so I will see you this weekend if you are there and uh, hope to see you there and hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.